Haggai. Hey guy, I don't know how you want to pronounce it. I'm, I'm pronouncing it Hey guy this morning, okay? Hey guy, Hey guy, Hey that guy. No, we're not going to go there. Right. It's amazing for a, a, a two chapter book. There's a lot of meat in this book, and I'm not going to have all the time to go over it this morning. Even though some of y'all may understand, I would probably really love to do that. Um, I love I love the Word of God, Amen. I love reading the Word of God. I love sharing the Word of God. And I can be here all day long talking about Jesus. Because He's good. Is He not? Amen. It's just after Zephaniah. And some of you don't know where that is. That's not going to help you much. But if you go to Matthew and go back the other direction, go, go, go back towards the beginning of the Bible, you'll find it. Alright? It's short. It's one page. You might miss it. Old Testament. Go to Matthew and then go backwards. No, here you go. Okay. Everybody there? I don't want to start without you. I don't want to leave nobody behind. All right? Unlike the public school system, there will be no child of God left behind for real. All right? We don't want nobody to be left behind. All right. How many of you in this room would say that you were saved? I'm not sure how many of you say in this room that you were saved, that you were signed, sealed, delivered, going to be with Jesus. Amen? How many of you have gone through this wall for you? I got saved when I was eight years old. All right? I accepted Christ when I was eight, so I was young. Um, didn't know a whole lot. I just knew I needed Jesus. All right. I had this purple-haired old lady that absolutely loved the Lord, and she loved me, and I saw the love of Jesus in her, and I said, I don't know what it is you've got, but I want it. That's all I knew. All right. She was a Baptist. It was awesome. She, she was a Pentecostal hiding in the Baptist church. It was great. Because, man, she was excited about Jesus, and she didn't care. And uh, But, man, she just she would share Sunday in and Sunday out about Jesus. She would give the, the Sunday school lesson because, rest assured, my parents made sure I was in the Sunday school. Um, and it, it was just amazing her talk about Jesus. But she, when she talked about Jesus, it wasn't just up there like Ben Stein. And there was Jesus. <laughs> and he was wonderful. If that would have been that case, I would, I would probably slept through Sunday school like I did most of high school. Amen? Um, but she was so on fire for Jesus that it just, you couldn't help. It was contagious. And it got on you. And I was like, man, I don't know that guy, but I want him. And you say, I don't have going to fit my heart, but I'll take it. And she said, do you understand that you sinned? I said, no. <laughs> What's that? I said, do you, you, you ever listen to mommy and daddy don't listen so well? Yeah. Close enough. <laughs> she gave me the eight-year-old gospel, okay? She, she made it simple so I can understand right from wrong at that age, okay? She said, you got a heavenly father, God, and the son of Jesus came to save you from your sin. What sin? Daddy ain't going to spank you. Good for me. <laughs> All right? I know that. Daddy ain't going to spank me. I'm good. But she just began to share week in and week out, and just story after story, and then, you know, just seeing the life of Jesus. I'm like, man, I was so broken at the end of that Sunday school lesson. And I'm telling you, I was crying at the table. I didn't know what to do. I'm sitting there, and like, and she just looks at me, what do you want? Like, you don't want I want Jesus. I don't understand all this the whole thing you're talking about, because this, this is a big, it's still a big book. I just know I need Jesus. So she prayed with me. I can take you to the place I was sitting at in that room when that happened. I can't tell you the date, but I can tell you where it was at. They end up changing the name of the church now. Praise God. I'm glad they went to Luther. Um, yeah, Backstory. Um, but God changed my life that day when I was eight years old. It was in July, I know that. And it wasn't the fourth. That would be funny. Um, but God just changed my life. But see, then life happened. Schooling happened. Friends happened. Circumstances happened. My father passed away when I was 14, two months to the date for my 15th birthday. Well, there went my freshman and sophomore year of high school. Um, my dad was my best friend. That was a major <laughs> kick in the gut, as it were. I was mad at God. I told him I was. I figured he was God. He could handle it, right? I told God exactly how I felt. No uncertain terms. I was mad. God humbled me yet again. He goes, well, son, let me ask you a question. Who loved him more? Yeah. Not fair. Not fair. I want to be mad right now. I goes, it's not going to work. I'm God. And he worked me through that. But then I said, okay, I got past that. And I said, you know what? I'm going to live for me for a little while. I've been living for Jesus for a long time. I'm going to live for me. So I lived in the flesh for a little while. I satisfied the pleasures of the flesh. How many of y'all have ever satisfied the pleasures of the flesh? Somebody like, I ain't raising my hand to that. Ooh, don't you sit in that church, that chair and lie and <laughs> say you ain't never lived for the flesh. Everyone in this room at some point has satisfied your flesh. Now, some of you may be to one degree or another, but I can promise you everybody in this room is just as guilty. Amen? Because yeah. ain't none of y'all alone. That late... Jesus said that he who is without sin cast the first stone. So ain't nobody throwing stones in here. We're all in the same boat. Thanks to Jesus, we all have the opportunity of grace and mercy. Amen? Amen. 
So I lived for myself for a little while, and God the whole time said, hey, I'm still waiting on you. Hey, when you get done playing, I'm still here. That time I was living for my flesh, I had never felt so empty in my life. Because I kept looking for the next thing. What's the next thing that's going to bring me satisfaction? What's the next thing that's going to lift me up, make me feel happy? There's a lot of things out there that make you feel happy. The other side of that happiness is not so good. There's a crash after that happiness that's going to come. All right? I, I promise you what's going on. I say I didn't get into the drugs. That just wasn't my thing. I, I hung out with friends that did, so I had a blast watching them. <laughs> Woo, boy, that's fun. You don't need to trip out on anything when you have friends like that. You can just watch them. Like that is, a, that is amazing. <laughs> if they would have had smartphones when I was back, and I'd been so just like, man, this is fan. Somebody's gonna see this. <laughs> I would have been all over because man, they were <laughs> out there drinking. I tried alcohol. I put down a bottle of vodka one time, didn't even get a buzz off. I said, well, this is not for me. However, as a sleep aid, it was amazing. I'm not recommending drinking, you guys. No, that's not a good thing, okay? Because, that, that, again, that can lead to bad problems. But I'm like, well, that's too expensive for me, so what can I do? I, I chose the alternative. I chose the flesh. Flesh feels good, doesn't it? Those of you that are married, you understand this concept. Some of you not married, you still understand the concept. Flesh feels good. God made it that way. He designed it that way. It's supposed to feel good. God said, it's good. Do it a lot. He said, before we multiply, it takes a lot, okay? God knows what he did when he designed it. However, what does the devil come and do? He takes and just manipulates it. He said, this isn't good. He takes it and makes it worth something that is not what it's supposed to be. A little confession time. I'm going to share my heart this morning because where we're at in Haggai, we're talking about the temple needing to be rebuilt. The temple got started and all of a sudden it hit a hiccup and it stopped. So sometimes we get saved and we hit a hiccup and we stop. God said, that ain't going to work. You're now the temple. You can't just stop. you got to keep going. One time I was doing my thing, and I get done, and God, just as clear as a bell, goes, well, how do you feel? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's just sure as I'm just like talking to you right now. That's exactly how do you feel. <clears throat> and I did a real quick inventory, like that fast. I said, I didn't feel anything. God goes, is that how it's supposed to be? Is that how I designed it to be? Boy, God chastised me right then and there. You talking about embarrassing? Hmm. But I share that because God knows exactly what you're doing, when you're doing it, who you're doing it with. doesn't matter what the sin is. God knows what it's wrapped up in. He knows. And he's right there. And he's watching you. Even if you're a child of God and you decide you want to do your own thing, he's right there. And he's asking is that right? You know what's right. You know what I've placed inside your heart between right and wrong. Is that how it's supposed to be? I'm in the bathroom crying at this point. The other person's like, what's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I couldn't even talk, man. I'm just this blubbering snot blob over here because God had convicted me. And I'm like, oh. But see, that's my daddy. He didn't come in and he didn't whip my behind. He just put it, hey, something here. Let me show you something. You know. Because he loved me. He said, this isn't for you. You don't need this. You don't need this. Now, I still made a couple of mistakes after that, but when it comes to that area, but God said, you don't need this. I have something far better for you if you'll come to me. I have a call in your life. You know I've called you. Quit running. How many of you would say you have a call in your life? Some of you are not so sure. I ain't expecting you to raise your hand. Some of you know you have a call in your life. Let me tell you something. Don't run. It's not worth it. All right, you won't wear yourself out <laughs> trying to get away from God. God's always, he's right where you are. You're not getting away. All right, you're like that mouse in the wheels. <laughs> you're not going anywhere. Some of you, your mouse is dead. It's just going around in circles. Oh, that's not funny. All right. <laughs> True story. You had a rat. I'll talk about a mouse. <laughs> she has a pet rat. They just have to go there and pray for her. Um, but some of y'all are just spinning your wheels going nowhere with God and wondering why things are not progressing in your life the way that you want them to. Why? Is my job not doing what it's supposed to be doing? Why is my marriage not growing the way that it's supposed to be made out to be? How come I don't have the white picket fence and the two dogs and the 1.5 kids or whatever it is that their math equates to? I don't know how you work out with a half kid, but hey, it's whatever. Um, how come I don't have the perfect life? How come I don't have these things going on in my life? If you're looking for blessing from the Lord but you're running from Him, what do you think you're going to get? If you're looking for God's favor yet you're running from it, 
then what do you think is going to be coming to you? What are you running to if you're running away from? Because I promise you, you're going somewhere. You're heading a direction. There's not an option of not going nowhere. You're heading a direction. The question is, where are you going? What are you heading to? See, we get so caught up in life building our kingdom. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we have the bank account just wow, perfect. We want to have the career that's just amazing. I am top dog in my field. No one can touch me. <laughs> when you get to the top, you only got one way to go. Yeah. Just saying. Hey, not against promotion, not against yeah, developing your business. I'm not on. Uh, if God's given you a business, then be the best at it. Honor God with it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't, don't do jump change. Be the best at it. What I'm saying is, don't let that be your kingdom. That's right. Yeah, sure. All right, there, there's consequences that come when you build your kingdom. We're going to talk about that soon. Well, that's usually what happens. We'll get saved. We'll get to a point where we, man, this is good. I'm saved. I'm sealed. I ain't got to worry about nothing. And we start living for us. And we hit this coast. We hit cruise control. I'm good. I don't need to go to church anymore. I'm saved. I don't need to be in fellowship anymore. I'm good to go with Jesus. God knows my heart. How many of y'all heard that? I pray to God all the time. He knows my heart. Yeah. He knows your heart. If you only understood the depth of that statement that you just told me. He knows your heart. And I, it's just like, man, God, where are we at? And we've been talking about coming into God's presence. There's a four-step process of receiving God's promises. First, got to deal with the problem. Okay? you got to acknowledge sin. That's what Jesus started that 12-step program. Admit you have a problem and deal with it. Amen? Amen? There's a process that God will take you through of growing and developing. And He will work in your life. And He will He will stretch you. He will shave some things off of you. He will take people out of your life. That's not always pleasant. Amen? Amen? But God will begin to reveal you to you. But the cool thing about it, before He takes you to the promise, He wants you to come to His presence. Amen. He wants you to come and be before Him. You look in the Old Testament, you'll see it clear as a bell. Because it's a shadow and type of the New Testament and everything else. Where's the first message that Jesus preached? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. What? you got to deal with the problem first. you got to go through the process of acknowledge all that. And he says, all right, I want you to come to me. Jesus began to draw to himself. You see that in the Old Testament. He brought it to his presence first before they ever went to the promise. You see what happens when it begins to get real with Jesus. We typically do just what the children of Israel did. We take a step back. <coughs> because it gets intense at that point. See, the whole mountain was shaking. I mean, that thing looked like it's on fire. Everything else is going on. We're like, God, mm, we're good, Mo. Go ahead. We'll stay back here. You relay the message, all right? Hey, you talk to God. We can't handle that. That's what most people do when they come to church. Pastor, you talk to God. I'm good. Then why do you keep coming in every week broken? Why do you keep coming in carrying this weight of bondage on you if you're so good? If you got it all together, why is it you look like you're about to die? I'm good, Pastor. I'm good. You talk to Jesus for me. No. You talk to Jesus for you. I'll pray in agreement with you. Then we might start seeing things happen. Amen. I can't talk to Jesus for you. It's your relationship with Christ, not mine. Mine's, I got enough going on. So do you. We have one mediator between God and man. That's Christ. Okay, we have the mediator, but you got to go to Jesus. Anybody ever comes to me and wants to ask me for counseling, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, have you prayed about it? Straight up. I'm going to ask you if you pray, if you haven't prayed about it, I'm going to tell you to go pray about it first. And you ain't going to do me one of those things where you come out there and say, I prayed about it. Mm -mm. <laughs> You're going to seek the Lord. You're going to just say, Well, I, pray, I prayed and I didn't hear nothing. Did you shut up long enough to listen? Come on. Be still and know that I'm God. I mean, sh <laughs> shut your mouth. God said, I'm trying to talk. <laughs> You're like, blah, 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 blah. And you ain't praying in tongues. You just gibber jabber. God's trying to speak to you, and you're going 90 to nothing. Amen. Some of you may be doing it out loud. It's all up here. Um, Your mind is yeah. racing. It's just, it's going. And God's like, okay, did you get the right side? Stop. Hey, hey, you're, what? Too busy. Stop going on. God's like, I'm trying to talk to you, asking me stuff. I'm trying to help you out. He wants. I think God just goes, bloop, bloop, get your attention. How many of y'all ever experienced that? You go, 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 guy just goes, dick! And you get tripped up all of a sudden. Because I got your attention now. <laughs> then we begin to cry, oh God! That broke my nose. God says, okay, now that you're not so busy, maybe you can actually hear my voice. Amen. God will allow things to come into our life to get us tripped up so we can hear him. Sure. It took a, le a letter from a crazy lady to get him in the, in the cave. 
He just killed 400 people. He panics over a letter. Oh, I got a bad Facebook post. I gotta go. I got a thread on Facebook. Oh, no, it must be real. The guy's like, what are you doing in the cave? I thought all I could do was just kill me now. I said, no, I ain't known you yet. I'm done. I said, no, you're not. You still got work to do. Get out of this cave. He said, ah, no, there's no one left. What do you mean there's no one left? You just met someone so the other day. He said he saved over 100. I was like, no, there's no one left. It's just me. All right, we need to have re-education about hearing my voice. <laughs> God begins, all right, he shows him who he is. Shows him the stillness of who he is. So now, come on, get in that place of peace and rest in me. Now get out of this cave, you got stuff to do. Some of y'all have been hiding in a cave too long. You've had some hiccups, you've had some things come in your life, you're safe, but you've been hiding in a cave. It's time to get out of the cave. It's time to get back to building God's temple. Amen. You are the temple of God because of Christ Jesus. You have now become the tabernacle of the Most High. It's time to get back to the building process and do what God called you to do. Yeah. You're to be a light. You're to be a, a, a beacon of hope to those that are lost and those that are hurting. Your light is supposed to shine so before men that they see Christ in you. Yeah. Not you in you. All right? they, they've seen enough of that. That's why we look at I know who you are. Mm. If they're still saying that about you, child of God, we need to do some inventory. Amen? Amen. Look inside. Let's go ahead, guys. Let's look at this. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and gov the governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Now they hadn't had a prophet in a while. They hadn't had a messenger from the, of the Lord in a while. Now here's a guy talking to them and said, well, the Lord has said, and they're kind of sitting there, hmm. So they started paying attention because it's been a while since they've heard anything from the Lord. How many of y'all, when it's been a while since you've heard anything from the Lord, you finally get to the place and you're like, I desperately need to hear from the Lord. You're just like, give me more. You get to that place. This is where the people are at at this time. But just like any good prophet, he's going to call them on the carpet and say, look, you guys have been sitting back on your haunch. You say, well, no, no, it's, we know the temple is there. It's not quite time yet to build the house of the Lord. So he said, well, I'll get to Jesus when I'm ready. I'll get to building the temple of God whenever I'm ready. Okay. Let's see what the word of the Lord says about that. Verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you to, yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? So is it time for you to live in your own house, take care of your own business, and let my temple lay to waste? Is that a good time? Is that how it's supposed to be? They already knew what they were supposed to be doing. They already knew the responsibility that they had as God's people. But they were sitting back, well, no, it's coming. It, it can wait a little while longer. We'll just, we'll just wait. We're comfortable waiting. We're not, getting any, we're not getting any flack from anybody if we wait. No one's talking to us or talking down to us or picking at us if we wait. So some of y'all putting off doing for the Lord because you don't want to get the ridicule. You don't want to get the people picking at you. You don't want to get the people that are saying, so why do you follow this Jesus character? Don't you know it's just a crutch for weak people? You don't need Jesus. Come on, look how smart I am. Look how much money I have. And they'll give you scenario after scenario saying, well, you don't need God. Look what I have. I don't have God, and I'm good. You're miserable. I can see it all over you. You are miserable. You are empty inside. It's not the dollar amount that you have. It's not the number of women or men that you've been with. It's none of those things. It all comes back to Jesus Christ if you're ever going to be filled. Amen. We were created to worship. We were created to praise and honor something greater than ourselves. So we'll look for that in any avenue that we can find. We will worship something. I promise you, you will worship something. Sure. question is, what's bringing you life? Amen. Everything else other than Jesus Christ will bring you death. I can promise you that. You want to do a job? You'll age before your time. You want to do drugs and alcohol? You'll age before your time. It will take its toll on your body. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You won't pay a price. Some of you that are in business, you know you've got to pay employees. You know what it is to pay wages. Why do you want to pay death? Is that who you want on your payroll? Not who I want on my payroll. I'm good. Stop putting off what God is calling you to do. Seek the Lord. He goes, verse 5 says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, why? Because you've been sitting back and doing nothing, and you've been putting it off. Consider your ways. 
And I love what he goes into here. This is awesome. Because some of you, remember I told you before, you're wondering why things aren't coming the way up, the way you think they're supposed to be happening in your life right now? God has an answer for everything. It's awesome. And it's better than your answer. It says, you have so much and bring in little. That's almost a contradiction in terms, isn't it? Because when you sow, you're supposed to reap. A seed produces way more than itself. But it's saying here, the math don't add up. You're sowing a lot, but you're getting little in return. There's a problem. And they recognize this, but they're not figuring out why. See, some of you are recognizing there's an issue, but you don't understand why there's an issue. Why am I not receiving back what I've put out? Because I know I've sown good seed. I know the principles. I know the process. But why is it that I'm not receiving the harvest? What's going on? Something's hindering it. I don't know. Let me just keep going. See, that's what people do for years. They'll just keep doing it. They'll keep doing it. Yeah. He goes on and says, you eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You're going after all these things, but you're still not satisfied. You've got food in your belly, but it's not enough. You ever been hungry and never, never could figure out what it was you wanted to eat? But man, you're like, man, I am really hungry. Yeah. Holy Spirit saying, feed me! <laughs> Holy Spirit saying, I need the word, put it in me, come on! And you're like, but I'm so hungry, you're looking in the fridge. And the Holy Spirit saying, not, it's not going to cut it. There ain't nothing in that fridge going to take care of what you need to have need of. Amen. You need to get in your Bible. I don't like to read. There's audio books. <laughs> God will leave you without excuse. <laughs> he wants so desperately to be with you and you with him that he sent his son to die. Amen. Sure. Pave the way for you. Jesus prayed, let us be one, Dad, as we are one. Talk about the disciples. He wanted the disciples and himself to be just like him in the Bible. He prayed that. He sought that. He gave his life for that. And we're like, oh. I'm not so sure I want that. But that's how we live our life. We might not say it like that, but by our actions we show what we're doing. But then we whine and complain because we don't have. Or we don't think we have enough. It says, he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. How many of y'all end up with too much month at the end of the money? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. You end up with way too much a month at the end of the money. You still got like two weeks to go, like I I'm out of money. Yeah. You ever tried to look at why? Oh, come on. Well, this bill, that bill, okay. Some of the bills, who created them? Who sought the Lord before creating those bills? We become like the kings. God brought us out here to die. The prophet said, no, you brought you out here to die. You didn't see God. You went out here to go to war to do something to accomplish gain for yourself, but you never saw the Lord in it. Now you're on a desert place of dying. But not just you. Everyone you brought with you is also suffering and dying. So think about this. You ain't suffering alone. Your sin will affect those around you, I promise you. Okay? Prophet comes in and says, look, all right, Lord, the Lord will bring deliverance, but you need to do this. You need to dig some holes. Can you imagine I tell someone they're already hot and tired in the desert to dig holes in the desert? They're already ticked off. They're already mad. Prophet says, I want you to dig some holes. I don't want to do work. Some of you, God's telling you and giving you the way out. He's giving you a plan and a way and a procedure to move forward. You're like, no, nah, it's too much. So you want to suffer and die. You don't want to do the plan of the Lord. Okay. Cool thing about God, he'll let you do it. He'll let you have your way. And it will destroy you. Well, how come God doesn't intervene? He allows for free will. Right. But see, he brings his word to hopefully bring conviction to stir you to move. Yes. And to make change in your life. And he goes on verse 7, says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He says it twice. He's establishing something. He's given it very much importance for you to take notice of. God says it twice. You better take note. Consider your ways. We need to be regularly, as children of God, doing self-inventory to see where we're at in the Lord. We need to be in the mirror of the Word, looking and seeing what's going on in us that doesn't line up with Him. And the cool thing about it, God will show you. And there may be things in your life now, not an issue. Give a little bit of growth in the season with the Lord and say, nope, that's an issue. Oh, okay. See, the more you grow in Christ, the more you want to please Him, the more you want to do your life the right way, and you want to honor the Father. Amen. Right. 
And you want to get rid of whatever he tells you to get rid of, even if it ain't pleasant. Even if it's that friend or that boyfriend or whatever. And God said, that's not for you. But I like it. It's killing you. Because some of you, this is how you're arguing right now with God. He's trying to tell you the changes you need to make. He's trying to give you very clear direction that's going to bring you life. You're like, I'm good. I want to stay right where I'm at. God says, I have so much better for you on the other side of this if you just hang on. Follow my instructions. Be obedient to what I'm telling you to do, and you will be blessed. And go there, my God, he blesses without measure. It's awesome when you start walking in that. Amen? Amen. Yes. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. How many of you in here actually have experienced the blessing of the Lord? You're like, man, I don't see how that's even possible, but here it is. Oh, yeah. It's in my life right now, and I'm seeing it. It's sure. amazing. I don't get it. Good. You don't need to get it. Just praise God. Amen. Because you try to rationalize it, it's going to become something else. You'll take away the blessing that God's going to put in your life. Then it becomes about you. Amen? He tells them, go up to the mountains, bring wood, and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. He says, look, you sat back long enough. You sat idle long enough. It's time to get up. Go to the mountain and do what needs to be doing. You know what needs to be done. You know exactly how to do it. And he goes on. He says, you looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, it, I blew it away. Why? Says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins. Well, every one of you runs to his own house. God tells you exactly what's going on. He don't leave nothing. He don't miss words. You want to know why you're not getting where you want to get? My house is in shambles. My temple is a joke. It is a laughing stock among the people. You want to know why you're not getting blessing? And you call yourself my children, yet you leave my house in disarray? I don't think so. You represent Christ to the world around you. You represent Him to everybody you come into contact with. How's that temple looking? Amen. I'm not preaching to y'all. I'm preaching to myself, too. I have to ask myself, how is the temple looking? All right now, I kind of look like a goat. It's okay. We'll get through it. But I have to look. What are people seeing in my life? What are they hearing come out of my lips? What are they seeing my actions do? Is it representative of Christ or is it representative of the world? Yeah. Okay, there's systems that God has allowed and has blessed in this world that are great. They're good systems. And they're, you know, they, they function. All right? God gave us wisdom to set up things. But when you take God out of the system, the system begins to fall apart. So you can take your systems without God. They're going to fall apart. It's like taking the gas out of a vehicle. Everything's there for it to work, but you take the gas out of it, you're not going to get very far. You take the oil out of it, still got gas in it. This goes into a whole other story, and I'm not going to go there. It'll run hot, it'll run for a while, but it's like, clink. It's one thing to run out of gas. It's a whole other thing to run out of oil, amen? You run out of oil in the car, that car's done. That's okay, I got to say. You run out of the Holy Spirit in the church, that church is done. There's no way around. You run out of the Holy Spirit, the church is done. Guess what? <laughs> You're the church. Say, <laughs> yes. so that's me! That's me! And how's your oil? You checking lately? Check one. You better check your oil. Because sooner or later you're going to get running hot. Also, that third jumper's going to lock up. You're going to be in trouble. Yeah. Something to think about. That wasn't even the notes. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I don't have notes, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Praise God. He goes on. Love this. He goes, therefore the heavens above you, we've been talking about this for a while, that your sin actually affects the land and area around you. So I believe, no, it doesn't. Yes, it does. Why do we have earthquakes? Why do we have hurricanes? Why do we have all this stuff going on? It's because of sin. Amen. You get a corporate group of sin going on, it causes big problems. All right? You get one sin, it, causes, it still causes a problem, but nowhere near when you have corporate sin. You have the body... <laughs> And the, the people of God, in corporate sin right now, it's causing major problems. Why was it that nothing was happening? Why was the fruit not coming forth? God tells you exactly why nothing's happening. One, he explains the, the main reason, and then he shows the symptoms. The main reason, the cause of the problem, is that his temple is in ruins. The symptoms of every, are everything else. How many know when you go take care of a problem, you need to take care of the actual problem, not just the symptoms? Yeah. Sure. Amen. If you want a cure, you go to the source. You don't go to the symptoms. Yeah. You go to what's causing the problem. He goes on and says, Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. 
For I call for a drought on the land, and the mountains, on the grain, and on the new wine, and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. God said, I'm going to touch every area of your life as long as this temple lays the way that it does. You're going to work yourself into the ground for no gain whatsoever. You're going to be doing all the stuff. You're going to be beating your head against the wall and accomplishing absolutely nothing until you get my house in order. Guys, you can't come to Jesus and not get the house in order and expect to be blessed. Amen. Come on. You can't. It's just not going to work. You're fooling yourself, and if you believe the lie of the enemy that that's how it works, you've missed it. I'm here this morning, hopefully, to share the word of the Lord with you that will stir you up and get you back on the right path of building the temple of God that's within you on the foundation of His Word and His Son, Jesus Christ, that you can accomplish what He has called you to do, and you will be blessed in your doing Blessed is the man who hears the word and is not just a doer only. Amen? God said he will bless everything he puts his hand to when you're a doer of the word. He said, but if you're a hearer only, you're only fooling yourself. Right. That's what the word says. That's not me, that's God. Look it up. I ain't going to tell you where it's at. Look it up. I want you in your word. I don't want you taking my word for it. I want you taking his word for it. Amen. I've been at this a long time. I could mess with your head if I wanted to. And there's many out there that, so, that call themselves shepherds that mess with people's heads so they can get this right here. Right. Guys, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't care about the money. I care about your heart. If God's got your heart. He'll take care of your wallet. Amen. Yeah. Come on. Don't have to worry about that. That's why we don't pass the plate. You know how guilty you feel passing a plate to church, man? Some, hey, if you pass a plate to church, that's great. I know for me, I ain't got the money in my pocket. If somebody passes me a plate, I'm like, uh... <laughs> feel guilty. No, my man, just... As the Lord moves, you take care of God. He will take care of you. Honor His Word, He will honor you. That's a promise. Not mine, His. Take care of His temple, He will bless you. Wherever He calls His name to be, will be blessed. That's the next of this. I'll help you all night. I ain't going to tell you where. He goes on. He's talking about the drain, the drought and everything. He, he tells Zerubbabel, which is the the governor, and he tells Joshua, the high priest, and he says, well, all the remnant of the people says, obey the voice of the Lord. This is cool. They actually listen. Man, this is every, every preacher's dream. Everybody listens. As the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Where has the fear gone of the presence of the Lord in the church today? Where has it gone? Systems. Every, every church has a system. I try to be flexible, man. I, I try to be firm on some things, but I'm like, you know what? God got his own plans. I consider trying to have all the rules and this and everything in order. God's going to come and say, nope, I ain't doing that today. All right, fine. I used to stress out over that stuff. I just don't do it as much anymore. I ain't going to say I'm completely not stressed out about things, but I don't do it as much. Because the Lord will always take care of it. If I learn to, okay, God, you got it. I don't understand it. I've been faithful. I've done my study. I've done everything you told me to do. You take it and do whatever you want to with it. I've been up here, had notes, had everything ready to go. God said, you're not doing that this morning. I'm what? <laughs> it's been a week. <laughs> and are you my servant? Yes. Do what I say. Okay. It's going to have to be you. That's the point. Ah, ha, ha. So that's how I, I mean God converse. I mean, that's just how it works. But see, God begins to show things. It's like, man, if we'll just listen. Begin to fear my presence. Begin to push into my presence. You will bow before the Lord. When His presence begins to come in, your heart will be humbled. And your body will follow. When His presence really comes in, you're going to kneel before Him. And you're going to love Him. And you're going to feel His love. His love is overwhelming. Amen. <laughs> I saw this morning, it's like we're, He's like a hurricane, we're like a tree. <laughs> It's the truth. His love is, it isn't that we so much do it out of fear. It's his love is just so much. It's hard for us to even fathom that. We're on the ground. That's a good place to be before Jesus. Amen? Amen. It's a good place to be. And he goes on and says, And hey, God, the Lord's messenger spoke with the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you. This is the blessing. I love this passage. Some of you need to hear this this morning. Some of this room needs to hear that I am with you, says the Lord. Someone needs to hear that this morning. You need to take that and you need to apply that to your life and you need to remember that every time that he comes in and tells you something different. Yeah. God said, I am with you. Right. 
you listen to my voice. I'm with you. I will bless you. If God before you, who can be against you? What creative thing can ever come against you when you're in God's hand? Nothing. All right? It goes on. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and, and uh, of Shethel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Joseph, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. And it gives the date. The Holy Spirit stirred them up to do the work. There's a lot of pastors and preachers, man, they're trying to stir you up, stir you up, get you going, get you all hyped up. You're like, ah! by the end of the service, you don't know what to do with yourself. He's like, oh, no. <laughs> You're stressed out because the pastor's stressed out. You don't know what's going on. And you're like, that was a great message. And you get away from there like, oh. And then you do nothing. This is the result. When the Holy Spirit stirs you up, that's a whole other story. Amen. Holy Spirit gets in there and starts stirring. You're like, ooh, ooh, hey, hey, hey. Well, I can take on the world, no problem. Amen. I've had that. Well, I tell you what, Holy Spirit called me a few times, and now I'm just like, now nah, I can take this building by the foundation and flip it. <laughs> Nothing. I look like one of them strong men coming in. Woo! House flipping, I'll give a whole new meaning. <laughs> That's what I feel like, man. The Holy Spirit just comes in, His presence is that strong, and He allows me to stay standing. It's amazing. Usually it's that strong. I'm on the ground. It's done. I'm just, I'm, there's no standing. But there's times this presence just comes in so strong. Like, oh, go ahead, devil. <laughs> Today is not your day. <laughs> Amen. You're right, I would slap you just because. <laughs> I'm a child of God. You don't stand rebuke you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't going to be foolish. <laughs> I know better. I don't want to go home naked. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and go do something the Lord said to do. That's not a good thing. <laughs> oh, Lord's good. All right. A few more verses and I'm going to call it. <clears throat> well, maybe. We'll see what the Lord has. He goes on. We'll pick up verse 2 of chapter 2. He says, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw the temple in its former glory? I love that question. This is about 70 years or so after the fact, after the temple had been destroyed. Okay? He said, Some of you are still alive to remember what it looked like. I might ask you the question, How do you remember that day? That you accepted Christ. How, how many of you can remember that day? Do you remember what it was like when that temple was built that day? Do you remember the joy of the Lord that came over you? Do you remember the glory that came over you in that day? If you're having trouble remembering the day, let the day be the day. Reaffirm your salvation in the Lord today. And let His joy, let His peace come back into your life. Remember the joy of your salvation. When that temple is built, think about the goodness of yes. God. And the price that he paid for you. He asked him that question. Some of y'all know what it looked like. Mm. That also brings a little bit of conviction. Because what it looked like now. <laughs> Not so hot. <clears throat> Alright. Not looking so good. And he goes, and how do you see it now? In comparison with it. Is this not in your eyes as nothing? Isn't this, so, isn't this ridiculous? From what it was to what it is now? Come on. God said, let's do apples to oranges here. Okay, this is nothing like it's supposed to be. Right. World Trade Centers. Beautiful. Amazing buildings. After 9-11, what did it look like? 9-11. Nothing. Where does the enemy come in and crashed into your towers, took it down to the very foundation, and sometime below, and right now, it's in shambles. And God said, I want to come back here. We're going to clean all that up. We're going to rebuild. Hallelujah. We're going to reestablish. Yes. That's what it says here. He says in verse 4, Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel. He's telling the leader, be strong. How do you know it takes a strong leader to stand up Amen. and take responsibility? Sure. Amen. Child of God, you are the priest that is to service the altar of your tabernacle. It is time for you to be strong in the Lord. It's time to get up and do what God's called you to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. He talks about Joshua the priest. He says, be strong. He tells him to be strong and tells the priest to be strong. And all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord. He's not telling you, look, just don't try to do it in your own strength. I want you to be strong because I'm with you. Okay. Man, it, there's nothing like having a good coach, right? Because they're there to tell you, man, keep going. It, it's not over. Keep it up. Stand up. Man, I think of Rocky. I don't hear no bell. You know, he's getting all kind of agitated over in the corner. But Rocky's still fighting. He gets back up. He gets back up. God hadn't rung no bell. Amen. 
It's not over in your life. You need to get back up. You need to be strong in the Lord. Even when you think you ain't got nothing left, the Holy Spirit will come in and strengthen you when you rest in Him. Amen? He goes on, according to the word, I love this. According to the word that I covenanted with you when, I, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. See, God said, look, let me remind you of something to encourage you. I gave you a promise. It hasn't changed. Don't be afraid. Right. Yes. Don't be afraid. Do not fear. What were they had to be afraid of? They were under somebody else's rule. Building that temple could cause a whole lot of problems. Persecution? Oh, yeah. You make the ruler in charge mad, you might be surprised. You say, no, 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 stand up. Do what I tell you to do. I'll take care of the rest. See, so God may call you to go to some places to be before some people that you think you ain't got no sway over because of their position. They don't take care of God's position. Amen. God's above all of them. If God calls you to stand before kings, and you stand before kings, and you be going before them. Right. Amen. In the strength of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Man, there's so much good stuff in here. It says, for thus says the Lord of hosts once more, it is a little while. I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will make, I will shake all nations. Boy, that's going on right now. Amen? Amen. God is shaking the nations. And they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. In this time of shaking, the world's going to run somewhere. They're going to run to that brightest light. I pray that it's not a fake light, that it's not a false light. Amen? Amen. Because there's a lot of fakes out there. And the world's going to run to whichever one shines brightest. I pray that it's Jesus Christ in your life that is shining the brightest, that people come and they want to know, how is it that you're able to stand in this time of turmoil? How is it that you're able to have joy in your heart when everything is falling apart? How is it that you're able to stand when everything around you is just demolished and horrible and people's emotions are all over the place and you're still standing strong? I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you about Jesus, Amen. the rock on which I stand. Amen. Let me tell you about on whose word is a sure foundation. And it doesn't matter what storm comes. It may tremble. It may shake the leaves. But my roots are going deep and I'm still going to stand. Amen. Amen. I will not be moved by what goes on around me. It's more about what goes on in me through the Holy Spirit that's going to move me. Amen. 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 God, it's so good. It's so good. God goes on and says, look, the silver is mine. The gold is mine. God said, we get our focus on the wrong things. Amen. It says the glory, now I love this part. Catch this in verse 9. It says, The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace. How many said I need some peace? Amen. 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 If you're in the temple, it's going to be greater than Solomon's temple. Can you tell, tell me how much value God places on you as the temple of the Lord? Hmm? How many of you understand how much gold was used to build the temple that Solomon built and used? That was impressive. Okay? Everything was overlaid with gold just about. That was a lot of gold. <laughs> tons upon tons of gold to build this temple. God said the latter temple is going to be even greater. Even greater. And he chose that temple to be you. That's where God places his value. It's you. Yes. You are valuable. Some of you think, well, I'm not, I don't mean nothing. No, you mean something very much to God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. That he would do what he did toward me. Just, just, Make you beautiful. Just to just pour out on you and bless you. So everybody's so worried about material things making them beautiful. That's not what makes you beautiful. Ladies, you read the New Testament, it says it's what's on the inside that makes you beautiful. Right. You can paint a barn, but if it's rotten decay on the inside, it don't matter. It's still rotten and decay. It just has a nice fresh coat of paint. All right? I ain't got nothing against makeup, ladies. Y'all want to use makeup? I got to use it. Okay? Sure <laughs> thing. <laughs> but let me tell you something. Don't let that be the indicator of how beautiful you are to somebody. Amen. 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 Ladies, you're a child of God. That makes you beautiful above any treasure of this earth. Sure. Amen. It doesn't matter the paint you put on the outside. As long as Jesus is the paint on the inside, you outshine every Amen. 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 Some of y'all need to hear that this morning. God is so, he loves you so much. Men, be the men of God. Stop worrying about what people think of you. Be the man of God and stand up and be counted. Be strong and do the work he's called you to do. Amen. Let's pick up in verse 11. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, 
If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil, or any food, will it become holy? The priest said, no. Haggai said this. He says, if one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? So the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Do you catch the significance here in these two verses? You may be carrying something holy. Just because you touch something doesn't mean it's going to become holy. But he says the flip side of that, though, is that if it's unclean and you touch something, it becomes unclean. And it said everything you touch. It didn't just slip, it just a little bit. This is a call to holiness in case you're not catching this. This is a very clear call to holy living, a very clear call to walking before God in holiness and truth. We are to worship God at what? And be holy because the God that we serve is also holy. holy. It only takes a little bit of dirt to go make a lot of mess. A little bit of sin in your life goes a long way. Is it really worth that few minutes on TV to take in that garbage and you have to spend all week trying to fight that little bit of garbage you took in? Amen. Or listening to that radio station. Or listening or watching that thing on Snapchat or Kick or Twitter or whatever the social media outlet is that you use. <coughs> is it really worth it to have to fight the whole week just to get back in the presence of the Lord because of that stain that's now there? It's not, and I'm not talking about your salvation. Please hear me when I say I'm not talking about your salvation. What I am talking is about the presence of God that will be lifted because of sin. We need, as believers, the presence of God if we're going to make it. Yes. If we're going to be effective, we've got to have the presence of God in our life. Period. It's, true. it's the very breath that we breathe is the presence of God. He's the one that breathed life into us. Amen? Go back to the beginning. Amen. God breathed life into us. It's very important that we have His presence. A little bit of sin goes a long way. It only takes a few drops of most poison to kill a person. It don't take much. Just a few grains of certain poison, if it's in a granular form, to kill you. Sin is the worst poison out there because it doesn't touch you physically as much as it will spiritually. Amen. Is that what you want? Oh, no. That's, that, those little two verses. There you go. Let's just put that in there. And he moves on. <laughs> So, so is this people, and so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. Ouch. Maybe what you've been doing for the Lord, because you've been doing for the Lord, to make yourself feel good. There's many people that do for the Lord just to make themselves feel good. The reality is God's not receiving any of it because they're doing it for them. They're not doing it for Him. They're trying to make themselves feel good because, oh, man, I did something for church this week. woo God's like, you didn't do it for my church. You did it for your church. When are you going to start doing it for my church? Amen. God's asking some of y'all this morning, when are you going to start doing it for my church? You've been building your temple long enough. It's about time to start building mine. Most people, when they come to church, pastor, I say, you want God? And you're like, that, yeah, I want God in my life. Are you going to live for him? Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> what's the bottom line? What's, 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 what's the fine print? Be holy. Because the God you serve is holy. How do I do that? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord. You ain't got to be perfect, ain't there? None of us in this room are perfect. We all going to fall flat on our face from time to time. Some of us are really good at it by now. We're getting scars and calluses, amen? But as long as we're making effort to go before the Lord, we're actually striving to go before the Lord. If some of you aren't being challenged by the enemy, whose camp are you in? If you're not facing adversity, you must be on the other side. Because I know the more you try to strive for God, the harder the fight's going to come. Mm -hmm. How many of you try reading your word on a regular basis? Yeah. How difficult is that? <clears throat> to spend any amount of time in the word. It, it, it's a... Man, just, mm, mm. I feel like the old cartoon, man. Give me some toothpicks and pop that bad boys open so I can stay awake. I need me a bottle of notice before I get into the Bible. Man... The enemy's going to come and try to do everything he can to get you. He's out here being the Bible and just start thinking about, man, I think I left the stove on. Man. What are my, it's too quiet. Where are my kids at? <laughs> I can't believe what she said to me at work the other day. Lord, if you just smite her with a lightning bolt. I'm sorry. <laughs> All this while we're trying to get the presence of the Lord, we've got all this other stuff going on. Yeah. The enemy's going to come in whatever he can to keep you going into God's pressure. Sure. However, if you're not trying, then why is the devil going to bother with you? He's already got you. 
I've never faced so much difficulty trying to get the word all my life than what I have to try to read this Bible in 90 days. But I'll tell you what, I'm so glad I'm reading it. Because I am gaining so much out of it, I'm going to do it again. Amen. Just to make the devil mad, then I'm going to do it again. I'm just going to keep doing it. You know why? Because it makes my daddy happy. My daddy says, when I'm happy, I'll reward you before everybody. So I don't do it for y'all. I love y'all. I do it for daddy. I won't make daddy happy. My daddy loves me. Amen. And he wants to pour out in me. He wants to teach me every good thing about himself. He wants to teach me the deep things. I can't do that if I'm not getting in his presence, if I'm not standing before him. Some of y'all have parents that you'll never get to know because you don't spend any time with them. You've got family members that you don't even know and you think you know, but you don't spend any time with them. How in the world can you tell me that you know them? I love believers when they tell me, well, I know the Lord. How much time do you spend with him? Oh, I go to church twice a week. Fascinating. How would that work if you were married spending two days a week or I am two days spending four hours total with your wife or your husband? How's that going to work in a relationship? Not so much. It's like eating a Snickers twice a week. All right, boy, it tastes good. It's not going to get you through. If you want to know God, you're going to have to be in his presence. You have to spend time with him. You're going to have to honor him. You have to get before him. That ain't easy. But it is so worth it. It is so worth it. Let me finish up. Alright. Just so y'all know, I don't rush time. Just to let you know. If God's moving, we're going to be here a while. And I think God's moving this morning. There's a good word here for y'all. Amen. Y'all need this. Y'all need some meat this morning. Amen? Amen. I need it. <laughs> Speaking of meat. I'll bring it later. Alright. Alright. <laughs> And hey guys, so this is my people. Talk about the people. Who's people? He wasn't talking about the sinners. He wasn't talking about those that are living in the world. He was talking about his people. I love the word of God where he talks to his people. The New Testament, he's talking to the church. So you don't need to change your perspective when you read the New Testament. He's talking to you, child of God. And everything there applies. Look at it. The shoe fits. He goes on. He says, and now carefully consider from this day forward, from before the stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days, when one came to a heap of 20 ephos, there was but 10. And the wine vat drew out 50 vats of the press, but there's only 20. Everything coming up short. You tired of your life coming up short? Time to turn back to Jesus. Amen? Amen. He says, I struck you with blight and mildew and hail and all the labors of your hands. Yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord telling you, God's talking to somebody this morning. God's, God's hit every area of your life and you still haven't turned to Him. Maybe today's your day. Maybe today you'll hear what the Spirit of the Lord says while it is today, as the writer of Hebrews says. He says, Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day I will bless you. Some of y'all need a change that starts right now. Amen. Some of you are desperately needing the change in your life that's starting right now. You can have that. God's offered it to you. It's a free gift. They can start right now. Amen. He goes on and says, Again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai. And he spoke to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and the riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. God said, I'm about to turn everything on its head. I'm about to show who the real power is. So some of y'all think because you don't have title, you don't have position, that you are nobody in the kingdom of God. When you have the Lord of creation take up residence with inside of you, it doesn't matter what their title is. You have the spirit of the living God residing within you. Does it really matter, titles? No. You're titled the King Most High. That means you're an heir with Christ Jesus. What's the Bible says that? You're a co-heir with Christ. I don't care what your position or title is. I'm a child of the King. Amen. I win. And I don't say that to be prideful or arrogant, but I know who I am in Christ. Some of you don't know who you are. So you walk around defeated. You walk around broken. You walk around with the weight of the world on your shoulders, not realizing, or maybe you realize it, but you haven't decided to let go of it yet, that Christ has taken that weight off of you. God said, their kingdoms are nothing before me. 
Here's reality. Your kingdom is nothing before him either. So you can build it up all you want. God says, I'm still God. And you are not. I want you to be in my kingdom, God says. I want you to be part of my kingdom. I want you to come in and join in. I want your, you to be grafted into my vine and let me produce the fruit. See, whenever you get grafted into God's vine, you're going to produce a lot of fruit. Amen? Amen. God likes fruity people. It's awesome. <laughs> Have you looked in the mirror this morning? I promise you, God likes fruity people. I look in the mirror every morning. That's funny. I get a laugh every day. I have something to smile about every day. Last verse. And that day, it says the Lord, verse, I will take you as a rule of my servant, the son of Shealtiel, the son of, says the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord, verse. See, what you do now, you may be setting up for later. Should the Lord tarry? You may be sowing now for future generations. Amen. Whose line was Jesus in? The line of who? David. Guess who's also in that line? Zerubbabel is also in that line. You too are also in that line. You've been grafted in to that. What you're setting up now may last for generations to come. Your pebble in the water may have a lot more impact than what you think. Yeah. Make it a good throw. Amen. Let the results be what they are to the glory of God, not to the glory of this world, not to the glory of your kingdom. It's about His kingdom. Yes. Jesus said when you pray, you pray one way. First off, honor God, our Father, our heaven. Hallow His name. Make it holy. Lift it up above all else. Start singing that His kingdom would come and His will be done here as it is there. That's what we're praying for. That just as it is in the present of God, it's going to be the same here. Yes. Amen. What you pray into the supernatural can become natural. Yes. If you'll be faithful, that's a big concept. Some of you are like, what? It's a big concept. But I can promise you that the state you're in is because of the supernatural state that's around you. Amen. What you're dealing with in your life right now is because of what's going on in the supernatural around you, right? And God has the power to change all of that. Amen. Will you bow before him this morning? Will you humble your hearts before him this morning and allow that change to take place? Amen. Yes. We still have communion this morning that we get to celebrate Jesus until he comes back. I'm going to ask everyone to stand.